بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين. So we said we have two types, two main types of tafsir. What were the main two types of tafsir? Tafsir. has two main types. What? Huh? One is chronicle, tertibi. Tertibi, chronicle, chronicle. They take the Quran, what do we mean by chronicle? In the order. In the order of the Quran itself, we have 114 chapters. So the Mufassir begins from Surah Al Hamd, Baqarah, okay, then uh, Al Imran, then Nisa, then, and then, uh, and then we have the other one is what? Mawdu'i, exactly, Mawdu'i, which is based on what? Subjective. It is based on subject. A Mufassir comes. And he discusses women in the Quran. So he goes, there are a couple of verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, few verses in Al-Imran, few verses in Nisa, few verses in Talaq, few verses in Ahzab. He brings them under one subject, women in the Quran. Or inheritance in the Quran, because inheritance is mentioned. In, or, or divorce, or family laws, okay? Or riba, riba, which is... Uh, Usury. So this is mawdu'i. Most of the tafasir, most of the encyclopedias are based on this or that one. 99% are this. 99%. So now, this is one, one division. The second division of the Quran of the tafsir is tafsir bil ma'thur. What do we mean by bil ma'thur? Ma'thur, what is ma'thur? Texts and the text, what, what what are the texts here? Quran and Hadith. Texts are number one Quran. So he uses the Quran to explain the Quran. Second, Hadith. He uses the Hadith to explain the Quran. The third is what? We, we said there is a third degree. Qawlu sahabi He uses the tradition of the Sahaba, not the Prophet, the Sahaba. And then after the Sahaba, he uses the tradition of whom? This is the fourth, Tabi'een, the second generation. So this is Ma'thur. Versus what? Ma'thur versus what? Do you remember? Okay, I'll, I'll simplify it. The Mufassir, the exegist, who wants to explain the Quran for us, one group of them, they use only the Quran and the Hadith to tell us the meaning of the Quran, based only on the Quran, Hadith, or the Sahaba, or Ahlul Bayt. But there is another group who incorporate what? Aql, Ishtihadi. So, Ma'thur, this is. This is ishtihadi, reasoning based on, okay? And then this is type number one, this is type number two, and we have type number three, which is what? Huh? Exactly, a combination. Of both 
combination of both. Now, what is the best example of the combination of both in Sunni or Shia tradition? In the Shia tradition, Majma'ul Bayan, the author is al Tabrasi. Majma'ul Bayan. Shall I write it, Saeed? Majma'ul Bayan. This is based on both. This is the best one in the Shia tradition. What is the best one in the Sunni tradition? Al Jami' Li Ahkam Al Quran Al Qurtubi. It's known as Tafsirul Qurtubi. Qurtubi. This is Tabrasi. This is Tabrasi from Tabaristan. This is Qurtubi from Qurtuba in Andalusia in Spain, southern Spain. So those guys, I'm giving you an example, huh? I'm exam one, one of thousands of examples we have. This is a sample of those Mufassirin who used both the text and reasoning. Now, what is the one who uses only text, no reasoning? in the Sunni and the Shia tradition. In the Sunni tradition, the Egyptian, Ad-Dur, Al-Manthur, the author is As-Suyuti. Dur Al-Manthur, Suyuti. He only uses the text to explain the Quran. In the Shia tradition, is the Bahrani. Let me see what is his, the name of his book. Yeah, Al Bahrani, Sayyid Hashim Al Bahrani, Burhan, Burhan, Burhan fi Tafsir Al Quran, Tafsir Al Burhan. They call it Al Burhan Al Bahrani. They use only text, only text, no reasoning. Okay. But of course, we cannot find this, only this. Why we cannot find this? We can't, we can't find this example. Exegist who base their explanation only on text, we can find. Exegist who base their explanation on text plus reasoning. But we cannot find only this one, an example. Why? Because it's impossible for someone to explain the Quran without using the Quran. He has to use the Quran to prove. To prove his point, he must go to the Quran and say, see, this is what God says in this chapter and that chapter. So otherwise it's almost like saying, I know what God would think. Exactly, exactly. And it's a, it's a big risk. Nobody will dare to do that. So they have to support their argument through the Quran and the Hadith. Through the Quran and the Hadith. So you can't find a tafsir that it's only ishtihadi. You can. Definitely he has to bring to support his. Like a lawyer who goes to the court and he doesn't use the, the books of law. He says, these are my ideas. The judge is going to tell him, get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> so this is an example of that. Okay? Now, we said we came to the first one. We explained the first one, which is Ma'thur. Okay, my friends, are you with me? We explained the Ma'thur. But then we said Ma'thur, if you remember, this type of tafsir has many setbacks and deficiencies. Such as what? Tampering with 
exactly. Number one, number one, number one problem we face with this is that we don't know the chain of narrators. Some of them are missing, some of them are weak, some of them are unreliable. Unreliable. This is number one. So how do I know that the prophet really said this regarding this verse? How do I know? Because there is a problem in the chain of narrators. This is number one problem. What is the number two problem here? Obstacle. Fabrication. Fabrication. Some of them, they claim that the prophet said this hadith. We will come to that one. That is the third or the fourth one. They claim, but it's fabrication. Wadda'un, al wadda. We said fabrication is, it's called what? Fabrication. Wadda. 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 Fabrication. Because there were many people who, who used to, columnists, columnists, do we, don't we have some columnists in the newspapers? Don't we have reporters? Fake news, don't you hear fake news? <laughs> there was lots of fake news at that time. Fabricators, okay? Some of them, some of them would justify their fabrications. How do they justify it? Hmm? They say, yes, yes, I agree, I agree. I lied here. But this is لنصرت الدين. I lied to support my religion. To support my religion. There is a story of a man who used to fabricate hadiths. But in order to give credibility to his hadith, he will reference it to those top ones, the imams of hadith. For instance, Ahmed ibn Hanbal and others. He said, he, he gives the reference, an fulan, an fulan, an, 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 Ahmed ibn Hanbal. When you bring the name of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he's accepted in, the, in that tradition. So they say one day Ahmed ibn Hanbal himself, he was sitting there, but the man did not recognize him. So when he finished the hadith, Ahmed ibn Hanbal said to him, come here. You mentioned my name. I'm Ahmed ibn Hanbal. <coughs> the man said, are you crazy? Do you think we have one Ahmed ibn Hanbal? We have 500 Ahmed ibn Hanbal. <laughs> <laughs> so to justify their stories, you know, they bring, you know, they, they just, even they, they do it on in the Shia tradition. Uh, many hadiths we have attributed, qala sadiq alayhi. When you say sadiq, you start shaking because Imam al-Sadiq, you love him. But then when you go and you, you put it under microscope, no. Sadiq is the last one to know about this hadith. Or the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> so this is the second problem. These are the problems of the ma'thur. Ma'thur, it's a good idea. It's a good idea to have tafsir. This, this way, this method that is based on text. What is better than that? But the problem, this one has deficiencies. The hadith is not going to get to you pure, salim, with no defects. How do you, how do you get it? So this was the second. Then, as Ali said, Dr. Ali, we have another problem called we will come to this in details and that is the israeliates why it is called israeliates israeliat because there were a dozen of rabbis and priests some of them were jewish rabbis some of them were christian priests who converted to Islam in Medina. Medina was a multi-religious society. There were Jews, there were Christians, and then after that the Muslims. And there were some atheists, some 
pagans, pagans. So some of those people converted to Islam. The top-notch leaders. And they had some agendas. As some Muslims, some Muslims they converted to Islam and they have they had agendas. They became Muslims, okay? They were not Christians or Jews. They were pagans. They accepted Islam because they had some agendas. Even now, even now. So those created a huge problem. And they started importing their own literature, their own texts, their own books into the Islamic heritage. And some of these stories, some of these narrations were appealing. It's like Hollywood movies. People would sit and listen to them. And those rabbis or priests, they used to be called Qassasun. What is Qassas? Qassas is singular. What does Qassas mean? Story, storyteller, storyteller, Qassas, okay? Storyteller, and the storyteller is talented, you know. It's like a, an actor today. An actor is as a talented person. He grabs your attention, Qassas. Okay? Storyteller. And they will bring their stories, and you know, in their heritage, they have a plenty of myths and superstitions, plenty. The first incident that took place where those story tellers penetrated Islamic circles and Islamic mosques happened during the era, the reign of the second caliph. In the reign of the second caliph, a man by the name of Tamim, Tamim Ad-Dari. His first name is Tamim. Tamim Ad-Dari. Tamim Ad-Dari ibn Aus. He was a Christian priest. Of course, there were others. One of them is Ka'b al-Ahbar. He was a Jewish rabbi. Abdullah ibn Salam, Jewish rabbi. I said about a dozen. We will come. Later on, we will come and discuss their life. But this one was a Christian, Qassis, Qassis, Christian priest, who asked permission, of course he accepted Islam, asked permission from the leader, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the caliph, that give me permission to sit in the mosque and tell people the stories. At that time, there is no internet, there is no Facebook, no movie theaters, no TV, no radios, no newspapers. People get bored. The only source of information for the people is the mosque. And people get bored. So he goes to the mosque, he sits there, and he tells them stories. And most of these stories were from his own heritage, which was baseless in the Islamic heritage. and the Islamic culture, it was baseless. And then, of course, another person by the name of Ka'b al-Ahbar, who happened to be a Jewish rabbi, who converted to Islam, Ka'b. Ka'b al-Ahbar, who continued this, this tradition. So it started at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. It got bigger and bigger, expanded, this business of storytelling. At the time of Umar, there, were, there was one person. During the reign of Uthman, they started to grow. It becomes a very flourishing business, mashallah. People gather around them, listen to them. So they, the number started to increase. And then it reached its peak at the time of whom? Muawiyah. Imam Ali, when he came, he banned them. No storytelling. We have the Quran, we have the Hadith. Don't bring me superstitions from here and there. If you want to speak about the Hadith, Ahna wa 
If you want to speak about the Quran, you are most welcome. But don't bring me stories from your heritage. Okay, and brainwash people with them. So Imam Ali had a very strict policy. No superstitions. We have this problem today, you know. Some of our fuqaha are very wise. Not only wise, but they have some sort of leverage and some sort of respect among the people. So they don't allow superstitions. They don't allow it in their circles, in their seminaries, in their mosques. They say to people, you have to filter things. Others, they are easygoing. They allow people to. We read in the story of some of our maraja that some of them, you know, they invite speakers, khatib, to speak on occasions the wafat of our imams, the birthdays of our imams, other religious occasions, other religious events. So one of them, he will chastise the speaker. If the speaker doesn't have good reference, if he brings a story or a hadith or tafsir of a verse in the Quran and he doesn't have a reference, he tells him, you are not allowed. You are not allowed to say these things. Come down. Or in front of people, he asks them, where did you bring this from? Where's your source? Don't tell me I heard it from my mother or my father or, you know. You have to have, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْحَانَكُمْ So some of the maraja' they really had. Imam Ali, he said, no way I can allow those storytellers to come and, and in the name of entertainment, in the name of keeping people busy, they speak nonsense. But then it flourished after Uthman, Many of them traveled to Syria. Many of those storytellers, who are about 12 or 15 of them, the well-known, the well-known, who had agendas, well-known. They traveled to Syria during the time of Muawiyah. And Muawiyah, his aim was to keep the people busy with superstitions, busy. Why? Because he wanted to enjoy the ruling. When people have time to think about politics and their ruler and the corruption, then the ruler would not be would not be safe. People are going to question him. But when people busy with these superstitions, they don't have time to think about who's ruling me, what are his policies. Exactly the difference between the West and the Muslim countries. Of course, not all people in the West. Many people in the West, they just here just to, to, to eat, to drink, and sleep, okay? They don't even think about who's ruling and what are the policies. But in our countries, most of the governments, they keep people busy, busy with some folklores, you know, some ceremonies. Just keep them busy. Let them do laqmiya 24-7, 24, believe me. Wallahi, they want people to do laqmiya. Let him get busy with Lakmiya so I can enjoy my time. This is the problem. This is the problem. We get sidetracked with something that is minor, okay? We put our energy, our focus, our battle, our debates over things that are useless. And we, we forget about the main issues. The main issues. So the Hakim, the ruler, the ruler, his aim is to keep people to enjoy. You know, in the Gulf states, in the Gulf states, you know how they keep their people busy? The entire nation from A to Z. Busy with what? Soccer. Believe me, the season of, you know, football and, and soccer. You see the entire government, the king, the waliul ahad, the, the whole, they go and watch it. Everyone is speaking about the game today. Every, even women, even old women, women in their 80s, they watch soccer. soccer believe me, <laughs> soccer games. They, they watch it and they comment on it and they support this game. They support that one. They are, and, and people are busy. 99.9% .9 of the nation is busy about the results of today's game. And they want people to be busy with this. So you don't discuss politics, you don't discuss economics, 
You don't discuss corruption. You don't say, where is my money? Where is my budget? Where is the budget of the, of the country? They keep them busy with these things. This is exactly what Muawiyah did. Muawiyah would invite storytellers. He would furnish them, provide them with money. Go keep people busy with these superstitions. Keep them busy. Let people enjoy these free Indian movies, you know. <laughs> and this is how he was ruling. Ironically, ironically, Ka'bul Ahbar was a person who brainwashed some of the companions. They were enchanted by him. Some of those companions, Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of the second caliph, the son of the second caliph, Sahabi, his Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab. Okay? Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As, Amr ibn al As, his son, Abdullah, Abu Huraira. Those people, they gathered around some of those. Tamim, Ka'ab, Abdullah ibn Salam. They get the stories from them and then they pass them. They pass them to the masses, to the people. So the reference, and then they attribute the hadith to the Prophet. They get the hadith from those guys. As an example, Abu Huraira, he would listen to Ka'b. And then he goes in the villages, he goes outside, and he says, Sami'tu Rasulullah. He attributes the hadith to the Prophet. Of course, those guys would not only set hadiths against the Prophet, fabricate the hadith, and attribute, attribute it only to our Prophet. They would attribute hadiths to other Prophets. Musa, Isa, Ibrahim said this, Ayyub said this, Sulaiman said this, Ya'qub said this. So the Israelis are not only about Islamic heritage, it's about their own heritage too. Fabrications against their own prophets too. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you, see, you find it in Sahih al-Bukhari. They found ways, and now they are written in Sahih al-Bukhari. Can you imagine in Sahih al-Bukhari? He says a story about Musa, that God sent the angel of death to take his life. He came back losing one of his eyes. <laughs> God said to him, what happened to your eyes, your face? What happened? He said, God, you sent me to someone who, who hates death. Look what he did to me. He punched me in my eyes. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. My... Sahih al-Bukhari, can you imagine? Musa will do this. Yani, ajeeb. So this is a problem. This is a problem that did exist. Even until now, believe me, some of those speakers who go on Friday on the pulpits and they raise their voice, they scream, Qala Rasulullah! One of them is the day of Ashura, day of Ashura. It's a day of big celebration, day of victory. God saved Noah from drowning. God saved Abraham from the fire. God saved Musa from the sea. God saved Isa. God did this, did this. All happened day of Ashura. So we have to fast and we have to celebrate. And do you know now, in North Africa, in North Africa, on the day of Ashura, it's a day of celebration, it's a day of dancing, day of festivities. A day they have someone called Baba Ashura. It's like the, uh, what do they have here? Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Santa Claus, and he brings gifts to the kids on the day of Ashura. And they have puddings, they have special sweets for these victories of the day of Ashura. Still people believe in that. The day of biggest tragedy, Banu Umayya switched this 180 degrees, you know, so people do not even know what happened, the real story. They don't know. Did that come from just Israel? It, it was during Muawiyah's time, Muawiyah's time. Muawiyah will, will tell the people, storytellers, go and tell the people in the mosque about this, that this is day of 
you know, Muawiyah and after him, of course, Muawiyah was before Imam Hussein, but Muawiyah attributed all these lies against Ahlul Bayt, and they continued this tradition in Syria. They continued this tradition. This guy, Ka'bul Ahbar, you know, if you read, I'll give you an example of some of his hadiths. Fabricating hadiths on behalf of the Prophet. You know how much hadiths he fabricated in favor of Sham, Syria. That Sham is the sacred mosque, uh, sacred land. People of Sham, entire people of Sham are going to, to go to paradise. God says if you want to, you know, uh, find a safe refuge, safe haven on earth, live nowhere except Sham, go to Sham. Because those are the victorious, those are the noble, those are the pious. Sham, Sham, Sham. Because of Muawiyah. When you read the hadith, you sense. You sense that this is fabrication, this is not real. Why out of all this land that God created? Sham, only Sham? How about Mecca, how about Medina, how about this, how about that? Only Sham. The best 100 people who are going to make it first to par from Sham, not from there. And there. Yeah, then, then where is Abu Bakr, where is Omar? If the best 100 are from Sham, Abu Bakr and Omar are buried in Medina, so how can, you know, they are not. So sometimes these hadith, they really can't, they don't make sense, but they did them. So this is the Qassasun, this is their story. Now, before we go into the second section, why did those fabricators did this, did what they did? What was the reason for fabrication? Ibn al-Jawzi, a Sunni scholar, Sunni scholar by the name of Ibn al-Jawzi, and he is an expert on hadith. Ibn al-Jawzi. Is this, there are five reasons, five reasons. I'm going to mention them one by one, if you want to write them down. Number one, these fabrications took place by some people who are naive, مغفلين. naive. They transmitted the hadith without examining it. Don't we have now naive people in the community that any story you tell them, they believe? Any story. Go tell them any story. Tell them that I, I just saw, <clears throat> you know, Donald Trump here in Starbucks sipping coffee. <laughs> they they send the text and, and, the, and not the text, the... Instagram that Donald Trump is here, Irvine, sipping coffee. They, they believe any story and without even taking some time to examine, they spread it. So this is number one. People who had no agenda, but they were stupid. Stupid, stupid people, okay? The second, <clears throat> people who are not naive, they were not naive, but again, they were careless in spreading the news. Careless, not naive, they are not naive. Some people are not naive, but they repeat what others said. They did not examine the text. Third group, they are thuqat. Thuqat means what? Reliable. But at the end of their life, اختلطت عقولهم. اختلطت عقولهم. They had dementia, for instance, or some sort of mental disabilities, who were also behind this. So they were reliable. They are not liars. But unfortunately, their mental capacity was compromised, so they started spreading this. The fourth 
are qawmun ta'ammadu al-kadhib. They had an agenda. They know this hadith is fabrication, but still they spread the hadith. And those are two types, my friends. Number four are those who are fabricators. I know, and they know they are fabricating, but because they have what? An agenda. They advance their agenda. The fifth group are <coughs> fabricators who realized later on what they did and they felt sorry, they repented, but they didn't change what they said. Why? Out of what? Fear. Not fear. Their, their pride. Yeah. Out of horror, pride. And I've seen this example, my friends. Believe me. I've seen it with the scholars, that they know what they said, what they wrote is not right, but he doesn't come, he doesn't have enough courage to come and say, I'm mistaken, this is my, my. He, he, just, he, he just leaves it, he doesn't change it. Why? Because they have a pride, they have a pride. So those are the five. Who are those number four? Can you give me an example of number four? What did you write in number four? Who, who, who is a clear example of them? Israeliat, and also what do we call them? They have a term in, in the Islamic history. This group, this group. No, Wadda'in is the general name of fabrication, but those specific group. Munafiqeen is also general, but specifically, I'm, spe I'm, I'm asking about specific term, specific theological term, we use it. They have a name. Zanadiqa. This is a plural. The singular is Zandiq. And the act itself, like heresy, Zandaka. Zandaka. Heresy. This is a tradition. Zanadaka was a tradition that flourished during the time of Imam al Sadiq. Why at that time? Why? Because it, during the time of Imam al-Sadiq was the end of the Umayyad era and the emergence of the Abbasid era. And it was a total chaos, state of anarchy and lawlessness, which allowed for some anti-Muslim people to infiltrate Islam, to destroy Islam from within. To destroy Islam from within. Ibn Abi al -Awja, one of them, his name is Ibn Abi al -Awja. He says, I myself, before they hanged him, they captured him to Adam him, to hand him, hang him. He said, I have put 4,000, introduced, fabricated 4,000 hadiths into your tradition. Halaltu fiha al haram wa haramtu fiha al halal. 4,000 hadiths. I fabricated, made what is lawful, unlawful, sounds unlawful, and what is lawful made it unlawful. Ibn Abi al-Awja. So they had, they had an agenda, and their agenda is to destroy Islam from within. You don't need military attack, you know, you don't need a blood, a blood, bloodshed, you don't need to use your sword, use your brain, Use your brain in a brainwashing the people. Today, knowingly and or unknowingly, we have some people who are doing the same. Well, we have people who are doing exactly the same. They make people run away from Islam, especially the young generation. The young generation today, when you ask them, they say Islam doesn't make any sense. Islam is not relevant. 
I'm not speaking about here in America. Go to the Middle East, Muslim countries. Muslim countries, people say, Islam is not really. Islam is something of history. We always cry, lamentation, depression, you know, being sad, being fearful. Islam didn't teach me to go forward, to move forward, did not encourage me, did not show me something positive. Islam, it's only about crying, you know, about being fearful of God. Oh, don't go this, don't go there, don't do this, don't say this, this is haram, stay away from this. This is how they say. This is how they say. And it is the truth, it is the truth. When you listen to some ulama, and fortunately, I say this with sadness in my heart, and some scholars, they take you 2,000 years back, not 1,400, 2,000 years back. You sit in his lecture, what does he have for the today's society? Nothing. Superstitions, history, repeated history, boring history. People have listened to this 1,000 times in their life. He's not doing anything to, the, to solve society's problems. People go to the mosque to learn something, to get inspired, to get inspired, to get energized, energized. I don't want you to take me back. I want you to take me forward, help me. I have a problem with my business, with my life, with my direction, with my child, with my wife, with my family, with my partner. Show me the way. It's all about tears. I'm not against tears. Tears are helpful. But do we spend 365 days in tears, in mourning, in sadness, in criticizing others, in doing la'nat, 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 la'nat. This year I was in Manchester for Muharram. And I really wanted to go to the procession of Ashura. But then the friends around me, they said, Sayyid, you will see things that you would not like and you'll come back home disappointed. I said, what is it? They said, some probably 40, 50 of them, they take off their shirts and they start, you know, <coughs> chanting and, and, and beating their chests in the middle of the street, middle of the street. Why do you do this? How, show me, show me one reason. How does this help Imam Hussein? How does this help the cause of the humanity? When you are hitting yourself in front of people who, who don't even know God, who God is, the, is, they don't know anything about religion. Are you attracting? If you want to do this, do it in your home. Shut the door in your mosque, in your community center. Shut the door. People who understand you, people who are, you know, like-minded, do it, but not in front of foreigners who's going to ask, well, what's going on? Believe me, people were laughing. I saw clips. People were watching and laughing. What's going on? Are you serving Imam Hussein? Processions has to do with, with knowledge, with enlightenment, with sharing information with people. When you do this, now this is the least. In other places, they do even worse. They cut themselves, they, you know, because I love Imam Hussein. But you are not doing justice to him. So, this is a debate that we have. Is Islam really a religion of inspiration, solutions? How can I show Islam to others? I just came back this morning from Colombia. Colombia. South America. I left after Friday prayers. I came this early morning. And I had a speech there. Saturday night, I had a speech. 90% who were there, Catholic. Catholic sitting there. Many of them came to me after, and they said, we like your, you know, you, though you are Muslim, but you spoke what we feel in our hearts. It makes sense. So, but unfortunately, when, when they listen to others, this is not the case. This is not the case. We don't have the, 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 the power. We don't have the, the, the art of attracting others to religion. 
We don't have it. This is why we are losing. We are losing many of our young generation. They don't worship. They don't go to a mosque. Because it's not, the mosque for them is part of the past, not the future. And unless you convince the people, especially the young generation, that Islam is the religion of the future, not just the past. Past is the past. We can't do anything about it. It's about the future. استجيبوا لله وللرسول إذا دعاكم لما يحييكم Respond to God and His Apostle when they invite you to the things of the future, things that bring you life. But we, يعني, it's really sad. It's really, really sad what we see. So these are the reasons for, wow, well, Does it go fast, or I feel it fast, or? Hmm? Yeah. So there is some debate, some discussion about the wadda'un. I don't want to spend much time on that. But they, both, both the Sunni tradition and the Shia imami tradition, the school of Sahaba and the school of Ahlul Bayt, both they wrote books on the names and the characters of those well-known fabricators, Wadda'in. There are names, there are books, books, theses written on them in both the traditions, in the Sunni tradition and in the Shia tradition, and they say they analyze them, why this guy did this. This one did it only for money. Money. It was a source of income for him. The other did it not because of money, because of political loyalty to this caliph, to this household, to this emir. Okay? For instance, Ka'b al-Ahbar, one of the things that he did after, during the time of Uthman, he was campaigning for Muawiyah to be a caliph. Can you imagine? After Uthman, he would tell the people that the most qualified person to be our caliph, our savior, is Muawiyah bin, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. This is one of the things he did in Syria. And he succeeded. But then Imam Ali came and they murdered Imam Ali after four years and eight months. And then Muawiyah became the caliph. So they had agendas, and they used to campaign and propagate for certain. And they, they had an influence. People would listen to them. They remind me of some of the conservative talk show hosts on radio, on television today. Three or four or five of them. They really shape. The other day I read in the New York Times that about 40 million people listen to them to two or three of them. They are radio, radio talk show, you know, radio. Those hosts, 40 people listen, 40 people is a huge number. 40 people, they dis determine the future, the, the future of the government. They listen to them. They listen to their, you know, <laughs> nonsense, and they agree with them, and they really shape the public opinion. They really shape the public opinion. People listen to them. And this is exactly what happened during the time of Muawiyah. And people say, why Muawiyah was victorious? For the same reasons that our president is victorious. He wins the elections. And he's going to be the next president too. They have this huge machine of disinformation, propaganda, and people listen. People listen. So tomorrow, inshallah, we will continue on this, on this subject, and inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ahli baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin.